Episode 10, Eric Barreto on why hashtag Ferguson should be taught in seminary. In this episode of Can These Bones, co-host Laura Everett talks with Eric Barreto, a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, about training students to parse Greek verbs and become wise readers of scriptures and communities. The Reverend Dr. Eric Barreto moved around a lot growing up. Born in Puerto Rico, he moved with his family to Louisiana, Missouri, Kansas, and upstate New York all before he went to college in Oklahoma and then seminary in New Jersey. This experience taught him how to incorporate himself quickly into new communities as well as sharpen his own sense of identity within those communities. It's a skill he uses and teaches as the Frederick and Margaret L. Weyerhoeser Associate Professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary. In his conversation with Can These Bones co-host Laura Everett, he talks about why it's important to bring events of the world into the classroom, what he has learned from teaching online, and why he is excited about the millennial generation. Laura Everett from Faith and Leadership, this is Can These Bones, a podcast that asks a fresh set of questions about leadership and the future of the church. I'm Laura Everett, Bill Lamar, and I'm Bill Lamar. This is episode 10 of a series of conversations with leaders from the church and other fields. Through this podcast, we want to share our hope in the resurrection and perhaps breathe life into leaders struggling in their own valley of dry bones. You spoke with Eric Barreto, a professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary in Princeton, New Jersey. Eric has some interesting insights into his work as a scholar and a teacher, and what that means for the church. Laura Everett, Bill. I'm so glad we get to have Eric on this program. Eric is an amazing scholar, a deeply devoted Christian who puts his teaching in service of the church. And he's carving out an interesting space as a public theologian. He's writing for Working Preacher, on Scripture, and the Huffington Post. He's also been deeply invested in bringing up a new generation of scholars through the Hispanic Theological Initiative. Eric is a Baptist pastor of Puerto Rican descent, and he's clear that his scholarship is in service to the church and forming Christian leaders who simultaneously engage with scripture and the world around them. I'm so glad we get to have Eric on this program. Bill Lamar Let's hear your conversation. Laura Everett, Eric Barreto is the Weyerhoeser Associate Professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary. There is so much to say about Eric, but I want to begin with this. Eric has what I consider my favorite Twitter bio of all time. I'm hoping that drives you all to go find him. He is a public theologian and a public scripture scholar. He is an exceedingly good human. Eric is invested in scholarship for the sake of the church. Eric Barreto, welcome to Can These Bones, a faith and leadership podcast. Eric Barreto, thanks for the gracious introduction, Laura. Thank you so much. Laura Everett. It's really nice to be in conversation with you, Eric. Eric Barreto, thank you. Looking forward to it. Laura Everett, so you've claimed a very clear identity as a teacher. I'm curious about how intentional you've been about how to be a good teacher, and what that looks like for you. Eric Barreto, part of it is that I had really great teachers growing up. I had great models of what it looks like to not just teach content but to help form students into lifelong learners, to form students in figuring out what their identity is, who they are in the eyes of God. And I think the other thing that changed my teaching experience was that I had to teach online pretty early on in my career.
Alder. I had no idea how I could teach Greek to 40 to 50 students online. I didn't know how to do the fonts. I didn't know how this would work, because all I had seen, all I had experienced, was sitting in a classroom at a desk with a professor or a teacher at the front of the desk. Now, there is no front of the classroom online. There is no desk, so to speak. There is no classroom, really. But still, we're trying to educate, we're trying to learn from one another. And I think it was that experience of having to basically start over strip teaching down to its essential parts and figure out, what does this look like? What is it that we're trying to do, besides just communicating a whole bunch of data and people to be able to parrot back all the things that I spoke to them? I think that opened up a lot of possibilities for me. Especially because these students were doing seminary usually in the midst of full-time jobs, full-time ministry. And the question was, if they're willing to take time away from their family, from their work, and invest in this, what is it that I'm going to give them besides the ability to parse these verbs as important as that is? What's that for? I think that was really transformative for my teaching, to think in that kind of backward design idea, what is it that we're doing this for? Laura Everett, one of the things we've seen of late is that there's been a proliferation of online syllabi created to help folks get the deeper context after an event. There's been the Ferguson syllabus or the Charleston syllabus or even Candace Benbow's Lemonade syllabus, to help unpack all that's within Beyonce's latest album. How has your engagement with social media shifted how you think about what comes into your classroom? Eric Barreto, that's a great question. A couple of academic years ago, this really came into sharp relief for me, because it was the summer of Ferguson and bracketed at the other end by a whole litany of other events around racial justice, including, at the end, the protests in Baltimore. What I was struck by was that I first heard about Michael Brown on Twitter from African American friends who I was following. I went to church that Sunday in a church that wasn't an African American church, and therefore I didn't hear a word about Michael Brown that Sunday. But I knew that there were other communities elsewhere that this was the primary thing on people's hearts. This is what they were thinking about, this is what they were praying about, this is what they were worrying about. And it struck me what different worlds these different ecclesial communities live in and that it was important for my students to know that there was a bigger world beyond their congregations. It includes their congregation. Their congregation is important but that's within a larger context of what God's people are going through and what God is up to in the world. So for me, part of teaching is to just spark people's curiosity, imagination. When it comes to scripture, for example, how important is it not just that I read, and have a full sense of my identity and how my identity shapes how and why I read, but also to know that there are other communities, other people, who read very differently than I do. And that their different readings aren't just curiosities for me to collect and for me to kind of stare at, but there are these different readings that encounter me, that open up new possibilities, that maybe force me to think about the ways in which my vision is too narrow. That, by itself the way that social media opens up other communities where you can kind of be a curious bystander, where you're hearing other people's conversations, you're hearing other people's stories, and you never take ownership over them, but you are a faithful witness to the things that other communities are going through I've realized that I want to inculcate that kind of curiosity, that kind of wisdom, that kind of listening, 
in the ways that my students read scripture, and in the ways that they read other communities' readings of scripture as well. Laura Everett, let's talk about those events, because I think you and I both started seminary in September 2001. So 9-11 shaped our seminary formation and what was at stake in that. And your students now, their semesters are framed by things like the presidency of Donald Trump or white supremacists on parade in Charlottesville and other catastrophic natural and human disasters. I want to read to you something you wrote about theology in Ferguson. So I'm reading Eric Barreto back to Eric Barreto. Eric Barreto, let's see if I recognize it. Laura Everett, so Eric, this is what you wrote, if our theology cannot speak in Ferguson, then I can't help but wonder if our theology is worthy of its name and even more importantly worthy of the God we yearn to follow. And if we teachers don't equip our students to speak in places like Ferguson and if we don't invite them to do so even now, then our pedagogies will leave us poorer as a people and a church. In short then, Ferguson is revelatory. It betrays pedagogies that are not up to the task and belies theologies merely posing as God's living word. Are we up to the task? Can we teach in such moments? That's what you wrote. And so I want to know how, just at a very personal level, how do you teach after a tragedy? How do you teach about ethnicity in Acts a day after DACA is rescinded? Or how do you go back into the classroom to teach a new declension after Ferguson? There is what is going on in the world around you and what's going on in your classroom. What do you do before you step into that classroom at Princeton or go onto that online space? Eric Barreto, I think that's maybe the greatest teaching challenge we face in theological education when it comes to pedagogy, that the nature of social media and who our students are and their curiosity about the world means that I can't just show up the day after anything happens and say, well, today we're going to do the aorist tense. There were a couple of moments this last academic year where even in my Greek class I said, let's talk about the things that are happening. Let's talk about what the presidential election means for communities of faith. What does it mean for communities of, we color? What does it mean for undocumented folk? And I would create that space because I'm not sure people can learn a Greek tense if their hearts are burdened in that way. So you create that space, and then you say, we've created that space. We've heard each other, we've learned something about each other. And now we're going to study the aorist, not as a distraction, but because this will equip you to read scripture in a faithful way that will equip you to answer whatever it is that moment of crisis, that moment of tragedy, that moment of joy, whatever it is when that community that you're leading faces the heights or depths. There's something about learning the stuff that matters, not because the aorist is the end to which we are striving, but because it's a means toward a faithful reading of scripture. Same thing in my class on race. That was taught in the fall of last year. There were other events around racial justice. There was the election. And it was a weekly reminder that we were not just engaging an academic question that doesn't reach out and touch the lives of everyday people all the time. We're not just reading stuff, these ancient texts that are dusty and old. We are reading these living texts that are still with us and that people still need so, so desperately. One of the challenges for us, of course, is we can't respond to everything. And we are living in a media culture where everything is breaking news now, so that nothing is breaking news anymore. 
So part of what I hope my classes help inculcate is a wisdom to know something about history, to know something about theology, to know something about scripture, to know something about where we've been and where we're going, so that you know when to respond and how, and not in any kind of automatic way. I can't give students rules for how to preach after tragedy. What I can say is, here is a bunch of wisdom that we have in these scriptures, that we have in the traditions that have interpreted these scriptures. And now you have to go figure it out. And I need you to come back and teach me what you've learned in doing so, so that I can help the students who are coming in after you as well. It's an extraordinary set of challenges, but it also feels like an honor that God would call us to this moment. It feels humbling and exciting. And every once in a while, it even encourages my courage along the way. Laura Everett, you're making both a pastoral and a pedagogical decision right there. Eric Barreto, the pedagogical the decision that I think teachers are making at that moment is that our students aren't just brains to be filled. Our students are embodied children of God who suffer, who rejoice. And don't just know stuff they feel stuff. And that feeling stuff is as important as any of the knowledge stuff that we do. So how do we bridge those two? I haven't figured that out quite yet. I think our educational system is really good at filling our brains. We're still trying to figure out what it looks like to be thoughtful, embodied, feeling students for a long time for a lifetime. And I think we're still trying to figure that out. Laura Everett, you know, one of the questions that we're asking with Can These Bones is, are the bones of our historic institutions able to have life breathed into them? You know, you could be teaching in a high school, you could be teaching in many places. You have chosen theological education as the venue for your teaching vocation. What is it about theological education that is worth giving your life to? Eric Barreto, I think primarily, it's because theological education shapes the church. Theological education shapes the church's leaders, both ordained and not ordained. It shapes people's imaginations of who they are, of who we are as God's people, who we are as Jesus' followers. So the challenge of theological education I think the joy of it, too is that I don't know what the church is going to look like. And yet I'm educating students to lead a church that we can't quite see, because God is already running ahead of us, already shaping that church, already planting that church, already nurturing that church. So that's why I think theological education is so exciting right now. I think these old bones can live. We've seen this before, we've experienced this before. The church has learned from moments like this, or moments that are kind of like this but not quite like this. There are things that we can learn from our past. And I think there's much to lean on in the wisdom of the people that have gone before us. They made a number of mistakes, but I'm sure people who follow after us will be able to point out our mistakes as well. And unless we trust in God's grace, we'll miss that even in the midst of all those mistakes, we'll do something that is for the sake of the church, because God is involved in the midst of all this. So yeah, I do think these bones can live. And there's no other place I'd rather be teaching. Laura Everett, so let's dig deep into that. The idea that theological education now is preparing leaders for a church that's coming, that we do not yet know in some ways that seems less about content and more about a kind of formation, and maybe even a set of skills. Do you have a sense of what you think some of those skills are our church leaders are going to need for that church that's coming? Eric Barreto, 
I would say it this way, too, that it's not skills versus content but content that leads toward the nurturing of a certain kind of formation identity and set of skills. Content is still really vital, but it's not the end of the theological education we're doing. I think at least one skill is this online wisdom that's not quite the right word. I always joke, there's a website called Literally Unbelievable. Link is external, I don't know if you've seen it, it's I think it's a Tumblr page, where all they do is they take Facebook posts when people post stuff from sites like The Onion and think it's true. It's just this constant mockery of people thinking this satirical article is actually true, and their outrage and their frustration. So what kind of wisdom can you nurture in someone, and how they read both text and communities, to be able to tell what's real and what's not, what's true or what's not true? I think that's a key set of wisdom, and I hope that reading scripture well nurtures that kind of wisdom. And part of what makes the reading of scripture faithful is that we realize that there's not just a text in front of us, there's a whole tradition of reading that has gone before us, and there are many communities right now reading the text very differently than we do. So what does it look like to listen, to be critical, to be generous all at the same time? I think that's one of the key skills that I hope I'm teaching. Certainly, I want students to know what's in the Gospel of Luke. I want students to be able to parse a verb. But in the end, it's about being wise readers of scriptures and communities. And to be able to then name the ways in which scripture has formed time that these communities and the ways in which God is doing something new that God has done before, in a way. It's that imagination, that God is doing new stuff all the time that actually God has done before, so it's new but not new. Can you nurture that kind of imagination and help communities nurture that kind of imagination and lean into the realities of a changing world? Laura Everett, let's talk about that that skill you mentioned about being wise readers of communities. Eric Barreto, part of the story, too, is that I moved from Puerto Rico when I was nine years old. We moved to Louisiana and Missouri and to Kansas and upstate New York, and then I went to college in Oklahoma and seminary in New Jersey and then on and on and on all these moves. Especially being usually, along with my sister, one of the only Latino, Latina, Latinx kids in these schools, you learn right away, especially as a teenager I learned how to fit in. I learned how to listen. I learned how to change my dialogue, to pick up new slang, to pick up a new accent, just to fit in. There's that skill of learning how you incorporate yourself into new communities, especially communities that maybe aren't particularly friendly to your own culture. But I think that's only half the lesson. More recently, what I've learned is you learn not just how to incorporate yourself, you learn how to sharpen your own sense of identity within these communities. So not just incorporate, not just fit in, but be the person that God has called you to be in this particular place. To say, for whatever reason, God has brought me to this place. There are certain things that this community can teach me. There are certain things that hopefully I can teach this community. So what you do then at first, you listen very carefully. You think about history, you think about all the subtext underneath the arguments that go on in a faculty meeting or that drive theological debate. There's always a long history behind that. And behind that, then, there are a lot of stories about people and relationships. So you don't just learn the ideas. You learn about the stories of the people and who they were and what might have driven them. 
It's that same skill that I'm asking my students to inculcate. To listen to communities, to listen to stories, and listen how those stories shape identity and the reading of scriptures. I think also what I do in these new communities, as I'm moving from place to place, is to come with the expectation that God has brought me here for a particular purpose not sure what that is, not sure I'll ever be able to really know, to pinpoint it but to know that God has brought me to this place and that there's something in my story, something in the ways that God has shaped me that this community needs, and that's why I'm here. That's why the community brought me, and that's why God has drawn me to this place. Laura Everett, Eric, I'm struck by the humility of the way you talk about a classroom. I'm curious about how you think about mutuality and power in education. Eric Barreto, it's a great question. I think one of the things is that as a teacher, you eventually learn to lean into all these years of studying you did. I remember early in my years of teaching, I was going to teach a course, and I was worried that I hadn't prepared enough. And one of my colleagues very helpfully reminded me, she said, you know, you've been studying this stuff for a long time. You probably know a bit more than the students do right now. So that's part of it that you've been preparing for this one classroom session for more than that week and more than that month. It's a lifetime of study and reflection. But you're right that these spaces are not democratic, in a way. I'm still giving grades at the end of the semester. I still get to write the syllabus. I still get to decide what we're going to read together. I still get to steer where the class goes. So there is a lot of power I wield. At the same time, for a lot of us, we carry these embodied or perceived embodied deficits. For those of us who are people of color, we walk into a classroom and we're going to be, often, thought of differently than our white colleagues are going to be thought of. For my female colleagues, their body itself, for some students, is an obstacle, a deficit, that they need to work through. Knowing those dynamics both that I hold a lot of power because I can shape what we do in the class and also that students hold a lot of power because how they perceive me, how they see me, will shape what we're able to accomplish together thinking about those dynamics proves really important, really vital. It's one of those things I don't think I have figured out quite yet, but at least naming it is an important step in the midst of all this. And I wonder, for those of us who don't have a career in teaching, we spend a lot of time learning at the feet of other people. For us to think about the dynamics of these classroom spaces strikes me as a really important spiritual discipline for us to engage. Laura Everett, you know, it was my Greek professor who, as I was struggling and Greek was not a strength Ellen Bradshaw Aitken of blessed memory said to me, the attentiveness you give to these words is a learned attentiveness you give to your people. That learning to pay attention with that kind of closeness and intimacy is part of what I can learn to do as a pastor. Eric Barreto, and knowing that the people who wrote these words and the people who are still reading these words today really care about what they mean and it intersects with their lives in the most intimate spaces and the most treacherous places, and the places that people are most afraid to show other people. That when we are leading congregations, inviting them to read scripture with us, it's a dangerous but vital thing that we're doing. It's inviting people to be really vulnerable. So yeah, even if you're learning the Greek alphabet, it's a vulnerable space for us. Laura Everett, Eric, as we finish our conversation, 
I want to hear from you from the vantage point of a professor in theological education who looks out on the wide range of students that are coming to study with you and really, the other places in the church where you serve as a public scholar. Where are the places where you're seeing bone connected to bone, and sinew connect, and life start to find some hope? Because the dominant narrative has often been about scarcity. Eric Barreto, I think the first thing that pops into my mind is I think about all the students that I've gotten to meet. I think of two sets of students. I think about students who came back after a long career to a call they'd been feeling for a long time. That takes courage, that takes some gumption. I admire students who do that. And it's extraordinary, then, how their life and their experiences whether it's in business or doing other kinds of work how that feeds into ministry that's faithful and needed today. That's one set of students, ones that show this courage and say, I've been we re running away from this call, and I'm not running away anymore. The other set of students despite all the things we read online, I am really excited about what this upcoming millennial generation is up to. I see so much hope. I see the future of the church embedded in them. I see so much talent and skill, so much generosity, so much empathy. All these things that are really hard to teach, they're already carrying within them. And I think in particular of and I've got to think of a better word for this but when I think about my younger students, I think about their worldliness. And not in a negative sense. What I mean by worldliness in that case is that they see themselves as members of local communities but connected to a bigger world. And I wonder if that imagination is what the church might look like. These local communities realize that we're doing vital things right here. We're doing vital things on Sunday mornings. But we're connected to Christians and to people of other faiths around the world doing many of the same things that we're doing. Asking sometimes the same questions we're asking, and sometimes very different questions than we're asking. But that imagination that goes, I'm deeply rooted in this place, and I'm reaching out beyond this community to the wider world, I think is an imagination that can lead the church. Laura Everett, Eric, that word of hope is a beautiful place to end. Eric Barreto, thank you, Laura. Bill Lamar, that was my co-host Laura Everett's conversation with Eric Barreto. Indeed. It's a breath of fresh air to hear a scholar who is very clear that his service is to and for and with the church and Eric embodies that. One of the things he mentioned as a teacher and I think that this resonates for pastors and institutional leaders, it's the kind of work I try to do at Metropolitan and you try to do at the Massachusetts Council is that students, in Eric's case, or the persons that we serve, in our cases, are not just brains to be filled, but they are embodied children of God. That embodiedness, that understanding that the people before us are not just empty pitchers for us to fill with our stuff that was such a strong ethical and, for me, leadership statement. Laura Everett, I agree. I've watched Eric teach in a number of settings, and he really does embody that awareness that the content is not the sole intellectual and formational good that happens in a classroom. That we are humans, we are people who come in with stories, we come from very clear communities as well, and we are accountable to specific communities. I have such a strong sense that Eric has this mindset of giftedness, that the students he is in conversation with have something to teach him, and that he has something to teach them as well. Bill Lamar, I broke into my theological happy dance on multiple occasions during this interview. But one, he talked about God being ahead of us, 
nurturing the church. Now, fundamental to my theology is that the church is not necessarily innovating, but that we are following God's innovation, that we are following. The work of the church is to prayerfully discern where God is at work in the world, changing, overthrowing, building, destroying all the things that God is doing in the world. And it is for us to find out where that work is happening well, really not to find out, but for the Spirit to lead us into those places. And I was really, really refreshed to hear Eric say that that really is his pedagogical philosophy and the way that he lives. That we are to prepare the next generation to be able to discern where God is at work and to catch up to God where God is working. That was breathtaking. Laura Everett, wasn't that beautiful? That sense that he is shaping students for a future we can't yet see, but he's got that foundational trust in that future. You know this, I get a little antsy with the eye when all I'm doing is studying the church to try to figure out how to do this work. And one of the places that I've found some interesting parallels is thinking about architecture. Resilient design is the core concept the idea that architecture, especially in places that are prone to earthquakes, is designed for tremors. Part of what Eric is saying is that there's a future we cannot yet see, and so we cannot design our formation experience for a particular vocation that's going to shape out to 40 hours as a full-time senior pastor in a stable community that meets in its majority form on every given Sunday, but that you design for a world that's emerging. You sort of factor in the instability. That conversation has been giving me life. And Eric puts it in a different way, about the kind of classroom he is trying to cultivate, and what the boundaries of that classroom are. I really appreciate that Eric didn't act as if his classroom is sort of a hermetically sealed bubble, and the news and the push announcements from the Washington Post and New York Times don't show up on your phone, and Ferguson doesn't happen, but we're just here to study Greek. Instead, he has a real sense that people bring in the wholeness of their lives and the wholeness of who they are into the classroom, and that that is shaping how he's teaching. I wonder, Bill, as you've led in your congregation at Metropolitan, how do you do that balance of like, okay, we've got administration and finance committee meeting, and there's just been another tragedy that has taken our hearts and minds. What do you do in situations like that? Bill Lamar, I try to remember the three reasons that Metropolitan exists. We exist to worship. We exist to liberate. We exist to serve. So when the tremors occur, worship is foundational, because fundamentally we exist because God has created us, and we have a longing for God. We come together as a community because that gathering as a community is not just us communing with ourselves, but as we commune one with another, we commune with the God who has called us into service. So we struggle to look Godward. Now, the Godward glance is not just a vertical glance, but it's also horizontal. So we are trying to remember that God is calling and then that God is also enlisting us to do the work of liberation wherever there is any kind of bondage in our community. That's economic, that's political, that's racial, that's gender whatever kind of bondage. And then also from that impulse of worshipping God and being community and working toward liberation because we think that that's what God does in the world then we are called to serve. So what I try to do is what you mentioned when we were talking with Marty St. George about returning to principles and values. We worship, we liberate, we serve. And not like it's some religious mantra but it helps us to focus. 
it helps to keep us grounded in the midst of the vicissitudes of life. But also, Laura, just plain and simply, it helps to keep us grounded in the midst of the distractions that are all around us. The internal personal distractions and the distractions that our community can get caught up in that keep us from what's fundamental and why we exist in the first place. Laura Everett, I think that's right. And I think one of the ways that I've tried to be mindful of that as a preacher I mean, part of my vocation with the Massachusetts Council of Churches is that I'm an itinerant preacher, so I'm somewhere around Massachusetts every Sunday, and it is super tempting to turn that into an infomercial for why a local church should support the Council of Churches. But I'm always mindful as a preacher that there's somebody in that congregation who just learned that their spouse is cheating on them. There's someone in that congregation who just lost their parent. There's someone in that congregation who just found out that their kids got an addiction problem, and they don't know where to begin on that. And so the awareness that we all bring the complexities of our lives into worship, into administration, into service that in no setting are we just brains here to work and to learn, but the fullness of who we are is present with us at every moment, whether we acknowledge it or not. That sort of fullness and the awareness of a wider world is part of what I heard in Eric's conversation about social media and the ways that he listens to communities of which he is not a part different ecclesial communities through social media. And he said, and I'm quoting him on this, that those stories are stories that he strives never to take ownership of but to be a faithful witness of these stories. And I wonder, Bill, do you have an experience of how social media is changing how you lead as a pastor? Bill Lamar, I pretty much am interested in everything, very curious. So I listen to everything. I listen to right-wing political podcasts every now and then. I listen to people whose theology is definitely to the right of my own. I listen to a Prairie Home Companion, and I learn so much about Lutherans in the far reaches of the Midwest. So I do my best to keep an ear open to other communities. I think part of the challenge historically in this nation and other nations that essentially have been empires, as the United States is, is the assumption that you can take control of bodies and that you can take control of cultures, that you can exorcise out of them the things that you think are not good or not normal. And the challenge is to refuse to take ownership, to listen graciously, and to know that there is not a culture or a human being, regardless of how difficult you find their perspectives, from whom you cannot learn. What you may learn is, I really don't want to be like this person. Laughter Laura Everett that's right. Bill Lamar, what we call a lack of civil discourse is because people are insular and in echo chambers. But also, fundamentally I mean, to me, everything is a theological problem it's that we do not see that all persons are created in the Imago Dei. From that basic theological understanding, then conversation and respect is necessary. So can you imagine this is a world where you have a highly trained teacher like Eric who respects his students not coming in tabula rasa that he must fill with all of his stuff, but they are learning together. And he learns from his students and teaches what he learns from them to the next group of students that comes in. That hope of behaving that way ethically in the world is the reason why I don't stay in the bed every morning. Laura Everett Eric is one of the people that I listen to and observe to watch how people make theological sense of some of the massive tremors that our country is experiencing now. And that beautiful way he wants to listen to stories from other communities without taking ownership of them, and take very seriously that stories from other communities are important perspectives on how we read scripture. 
So, for example, one of the things that's happened since I interviewed Eric is the utter destruction and devastation of Hurricane Maria to Puerto Rico, and the unbelievably ineffectual response of our national resources and collective consciousness. And so Eric has been a really helpful voice for me to listen to as someone who was formed by that community, who can speak of what life is like in Puerto Rico and amplify those voices. So he is sharing, what does good news look like when there is utter devastation? What does the light of Christ look like when 90%, 80% of the island does not have power? I really aspire to that care and ethical consideration of listening to voices from communities that are not my own and amplifying without taking ownership. Bill Lamar, Eric said quite a bit about formation. And I think now often about formation and culture together, because as persons are being formed, we're thinking about an ultimate cultural, theological, communal outcome. So how do you think about formation as an institutional leader? How do you help persons and local churches think about it? Because everyone in the door whether we call it formation or not people are being formed when they come into the space. And Eric thinks richly, robustly about formation. Laura Everett, I think we form people whether we are intentional about it or not. We form people to think they are unworthy, that they do not have things to say, or that their perspective on the gospel of what it means to be a human fully alive is of value and worth, either by how we invite their conversation or by how we ignore it. So beyond the sort of particulars of a formation program as formalized as seminary education, one of the things I'm always mindful of when I facilitate or lead is asking, whose voice haven't we heard? Are there folks who want to speak who haven't had an opportunity to? To keep an eye on look, I am a verbal processor. I am someone who speaks my ideas into being. I am the first one with my hand up. And so I know that impulse. But I think a comprehensive formation that doesn't just prioritize the formation of individuals for some sort of soloed, excellent, genius, lone cowboy mega pastor instead is thinking about formation in community. So how do we form communities to be polyphonic? To be places where we hear multiple voices and multiple perspectives? When I'm facilitating in that space, it's always keeping an eye on who hasn't spoken. Who haven't we heard from? Who's not even in the room? And who has gifts from other places of their life that we need to draw in? One of the things I heard in Eric was you know, it's kind of trendy to trash millennials but he sees a real giftedness in their global perspective. And at the same time, he sees giftedness in second career pastors who are hungry and have a sense of urgency for their formation that they have to work deeply and intentionally right now, that there is an urgency in the formation work that they do. And so the combination of the mindset of giftedness, that every person is made in the image of God and has an angle on gospel truth that I need, to see the fullness of who God is, and the sort of watchful eye to who is missing from this story. Bill Lamar, Laura, being fully aware of my penchant to stay in the clouds, I think a lot about the fact that the culture in our churches and institutions, whether or not we name it, instantly forms or malforms people. So with how people are treated when they walk in the door, their formation slash malformation already begins. So one of the things that I do because I'm very aware of the fact that after a while, if there is an odor in your space, you become habituated to it, you don't know that it exists, but someone from the outside can walk in and say, wow, this smells different. So when new people join Metropolitan, I make it a point to spend an hour with them, 
asking them questions to find out who they are, what they feel like God is prompting them to do. And I ask them always, so tell me, why did you join this space? What is it about this space? What do you feel like is going well, and where do you feel like we could do things a lot better? And I have learned a whole lot from listening to the newer persons who have a fresh insight into the culture. It's not that I'm not listening to persons who have been in the culture for a long time, but I get a whole lot of fresh insight from those persons. And I think it's good for us to think about what practical things we can do. There's some leadership guru, whose name I have forgotten, who says that culture trumps vision every time. So you've got this grand vision of formation, and to save the world. But if you have a culture that kills new people, kills new ideas, that rotely, rigidly ascribes some set of dogma, some outdated principles, it'll never happen, no matter how brilliant and beautiful you think you are. Laura Everett, you've articulated clearly for me the image about the smell and losing sense of that. I'm sure I have become too habituated to the smell of my institution. Bill Lamar, well, Laura, here is to Christian institutions and churches that smell wonderful that are an olfactory treat of the goodness of God. Laura Everett, I think the next time we do this, we're going to have to figure out how to make a smelling podcast. Laura Everett, next episode, Bill, next episode. Thanks for the conversation. Bill Lamar, thank you. Laura Everett, thank you for listening to Can These Bones. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. There's more about Eric Barreto, including a link to his Twitter account and some of his writings at www.candthezebens.com. Bill, who are you speaking to next time? Bill Lamar, I am very, very excited to be speaking with Mr. Vernon Jordan. He's a civil rights activist, an attorney, a close advisor to former presidents and a member of the church I'm privileged to serve, Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. Laura Everett, I'm looking forward to it, Bill. Episode 11, Vernon Jordan on his friendships with the great preachers of his era, and why he didn't become one himself. In this episode of Can These Bones, co-host Bill Lamar talks with Vernon Jordan, the attorney and civil rights leader, about the ways that the church formed him and influenced his working life. Vernon Jordan considered becoming a preacher but the law was his calling. Yet the church was a great influence on him. He grew up in and was formed by the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And as an adult, he was privileged to count the great Baptist preachers Howard Thurman and Gardner Taylor as close friends. In this conversation with co-host Bill Lamar, Jordan talks about growing up in Atlanta, leading the National Urban League, how his mentors helped him as a young man and why his mother didn't want him to become a preacher. Bill Lamar, from Faith and Leadership, this is Can These Bones, a podcast that asks a fresh set of questions about leadership and the future of the church. I'm Bill Lamar. Laura Everett, and I'm Laura Everett. This is episode 11 of a series of conversations with leaders from the church and other fields. Through this podcast, we want to share our hope in the resurrection and perhaps breathe life into leaders struggling in their own valley of dry bones. A familiar name to many, but to others someone entirely new. Bill, tell us about Vernon Jordan. Bill Lamar, when you're a young black man born in 1974 in Macon, Georgia, or anywhere during that era, and maybe a generation and a half prior to my own, 
your life was populated by Ebony and Jet magazines, these very interesting publications that told the stories of black Americans. And I believe that one of the first times I saw Vernon Jordan, it most likely was in an Ebony or a Jet magazine probably a picture of him looking tall and distinguished and commanding and handsome as the leader of the Urban League or as an attorney doing great things or the many corporate boardrooms he became the first African American to sit in. So he's just an incredible human being and has accomplished much. He's a lawyer, earned a law degree from Howard University Law School, a leader in the civil rights movement, an advisor, and close friend to President William Jefferson Clinton. Very influential in Washington. His face and the face of his wife can often be seen in the pages of the Washington social scene. So he moves around quite a bit. He was executive director of the United Negro College Fund, and he succeeded another one of my heroes, Whitney Young, as the president of the National Urban League. Right now, he's the senior managing director with Lazard, which is an investment banking firm, and he serves on multiple boards, as I mentioned. His career has not been without controversy. There was an attempt on his life in 1980. He was shot and seriously wounded. And to this day, he still has to manage his health very carefully because of the bullet wound. I am privileged to serve as his pastor. He's been kind enough to open his home to me and expose me to some things and meet some people that probably would not have been possible were I not in Washington, D.C., and were I not his pastor. And so I've been very appreciative of his mentorship and guidance and friendship. He also has become a confidant, and you can depend on Mr. Jordan not to tell you what you want to hear but to tell you what he perceives the truth to be. And I have to share something very special. In our denomination, the founder is Richard Allen and we do know we don't subscribe to the great man theory of history, Richard Allen didn't found African Methodism by himself. There were women, such as his wives, first wife, Flora, who died, and Sarah, Absalom Jones, and many, many others who made the AIM Church happen so I want to be clear about that. But in order to honor our heritage, we had a U.S. postal stamp issued with Richard Allen's image on it, and we were very, very excited about that. And Mr. Jordan was one of the main persons who was able to use his powers of persuasion and his long-standing relationships in the government to bring that to pass. And so on his 80th birthday, Henry Louis Gates, Skip Gates, the great scholar of African American literature, gave him a framed portrait of a Richard Allen stamp. And Mr. Jordan gave that framed stamp that Henry Louis Gates gave him for his 80th birthday to me. Laura Everett, oh, Bill. Bill Lamar, and I was tremendously honored. I keep it in a place where no one can touch it or look at it, so that it might be preserved. I am very thrilled to be his pastor and to have become his friend, and so excited to have the opportunity to talk with him today. Laura Everett, Bill, this is a man with an unbelievably full life. Let's listen to your interview. Bill Lamar, Mr. Jordan, thank you for joining us. Vernon Jordan, I'm honored to be here. Bill Lamar, thank you, sir. One of the joys of getting to know you as pastor is hearing you tell stories and spin fabulous yarns. And I think that people would be really, really delighted to learn of your personal relationship with two great people in the field of theology and ministry, the great Howard Washington Thurman and the great Gardner Calvin Taylor. Would you share some stories about your interaction with those two men? Vernon Jordan well, 
I knew them before they knew me. In 1953, I began my freshman year at DePauw University in Greencastle, Indiana, and my parents and my youngest brother accompanied me to begin my freshman year. We went to the service at Govan Memorial Methodist Church, which was the opening service for DePauw University. And the speaker was Dr. Howard Thurman. I knew who he was. I knew he was from Daytona Beach. I knew that he was a Morehouse man. I knew that he was the dean of chapel at Boston University, but I had never heard him preach. And there were only five black people in this crowded Gobbin sanctuary, my family, four of us, and Howard Thurman. And I was just carried away by his style, his form, his drama, and then, of course, his preaching. And I never forgot it. I went afterward to shake his hand, and he welcomed me and asked me what year I was and all of that. And I did not see him again until he gave one of the eulogies for Whitney Young, my predecessor at the National Urban League. The other eulogy was given by Benjamin Mays. Can you imagine that happened? Bill Lamar, wow. Vernon Jordan, Benjamin Mays and Howard Thurman to give your eulogy. That was something that Whitney Young had surely earned. And I knew that Whitney received counsel from Howard Thurman and went to visit Howard Thurman, and it was at that service that I knew that I wanted to call him. But I did not. And then a few months later, I was named Whitney Young's successor, which said again to me that I needed to call Howard Thurman. I did not do it for a year. And finally I called him up at 2020 Stockton Street in San Francisco. He answered the telephone. I said, Dr. Thurman, my name is Vernon Jordan. And he said, what took you so long? Laughter Vernon Jordan, and I said, what do you mean? He said, I've been waiting for this call. And I said, well, here I am. He said, I'm coming to New York by train, and we should get together. I'm going to be there for a week. And I said, would you come to dinner? He said, only if it's four people. I said, I can work that out. And the fourth person, other than my wife, my then wife Shirley, was Mrs. Whitney Young. And the four of us had dinner. We began about seven, and about nine o'clock, I took him to St. John the Divine, where he was lodging. I got him home about 9.15 p.m. And he said, would you like a cup of coffee? And I said, sure. So at 9.15 p.m., I went up to his suite, and we started talking. I left at 6 in the morning. And he said, I want you to come to San Francisco. I have a couple of rules. Two hours, preferably three, and no telephone calls. And so I made my first visit. I got to 2020 Stockton Street at 9 o'clock. Mrs. Thurman met me at the door, took me into his study. Howard Thurman never walked into a room. He never entered a room, he appeared. And he came in and shook my hand, welcomed me, and then he stretched out on his chaise lounge, and we started talking. We stopped at one o'clock. And I did that two or three times a year. And it's almost inexplicable what it meant to me, as the young successor to Whitney Young. I was not a social worker. I had just run the United Negro College Fund, but I had not run the Urban League before, and I was new to it and he was my spiritual anchor. Now, at the same time, 
When I came to New York to run the United Negro College Fund, I was introduced to Gardner Calvin Taylor, whom I knew just because I kept up with black preachers. I knew who he was, but I had never heard him preach. And Deanny Drew, who was the ultimate leader in Birmingham, she and her husband, John Drew, took me to Brooklyn on a Saturday night to meet Gardner Taylor and to try to talk him into joining us for dinner. Gardner said he never goes out on a Saturday night. I'll never forget that. And he entertained us for maybe 30 minutes in his home and then said, Well, I'm glad to meet you, young man, and we will see more of each other, but it's I have a sermon to get ready for tomorrow morning at my church. And we became great telephone buddies. I would talk to him in his study in the wee hours of the night. And if I needed a scripture reference for a speech that I was making, I would call him up. And when he needed a legal reference for something that he was thinking about saying, he would call me up. And we would meet for lunch, or we would talk on the telephone. Many a Sunday, I would get up in Washington, take the shuttle to Brooklyn, hear Gardner Taylor preach, and go back to Washington for Sunday dinner. And I was privileged to give one of the eulogies at his home going. The only reason I did not go to Howard Thuman's funeral was that I was still recovering from my not-so-happy incident in Fort Wayne in May of 1980. So these two Baptist preachers were my spiritual stalwarts. They were my friends. They gave me advice and counsel, and at times, in various aspects of their ministry, sought my counsel, which for me was a great honor. And not only are they the two most important spiritual leaders in my life, they were two of my dearest friends. Bill Lamar, well, thank you so much for sharing that. That has meant so much to me, as you have shared details of those relationships and I get a chance to live vicariously through you in those relationships. I wanted to also ask about something that has intrigued me in our conversations your own flirtation with a life in ministry. Would you share some of those stories? Vernon Jordan, yes, I grew up in St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church in Atlanta. My parents met there. My father was a chauffeur, my mother was a cook for rich white people in Atlanta. And my mother was an usher, and my father sang in the choir. So all of my life, every Sunday morning, I walked to Sunday school with my father, and my mother joined us at St. Paul Church for service, and we always took some sister home for dinner on Sunday afternoon. And so I sang in the St. Cecilia Children's Choir at St. Paul. I went to my Boy Scout troop one day a week and to choir rehearsal on Monday and Friday for the St. Cecilia Choir, underwritten by Dr. Richard A. Billings, a wonderful man who had a great influence on my young life. I also gave the best Easter speech, and I won the biblical contest and Sister Fanny Green came home with us for dinner once and said to my mother that Vernon Jr. is going to be a preacher. And my mother said, Sister Green, Vernon Jr. is not going to be a preacher. And Sister Fanny Green sort of argued with my mother, and my mother put it to an end by saying to her, Sister Green, Vernon Jr. is not going to be an AIM preacher, because no son of mine is going to spend his career kissing the bishop's ass. Laughter Bill Lamar, I try not to do that, Mr. Jordan. Vernon Jordan, I'm confident of that. But I kept thinking about it. And then I went to college, and in my sophomore year, 
the chaplain at DePau University convinced me that I should go to New York to Union Theological Seminary to a conference on the ministry designed for young men who were pursuing other disciplines but whom the chaplain, the professor, the teacher thought ought to be exposed to the ministry. And so I came on my first trip to New York by train from Greencastle, Indiana, and spent a week at Union Theological Seminary listening to Paul Tillich and Reinhold Niebuhr and James Robinson, of the Church of the Master. And I was fascinated by it. I was frightened by it, but I was also challenged by the thought of it. And I went back to school and took courses in philosophy, and some religious courses. And then in my senior year of college, I applied to law school but also applied to seminary. I graduated, went to Chicago, and I was driving the city bus in the summer of 1957. And in the midsummer, I wrote to the seminaries, and I said, I have spent the summer trying to determine whether to spend my life at the altar or at the bar. And in the process, I have discovered sin, and I like it. I'm going to law school. And that was the right decision for me. But there is a sadness to that aspect, and that is that my pastors at St. Paul Aim Church never took me in, they never sought to encourage me. Somebody would say, that Jordan boy's going to be a preacher. And the preacher would say, yeah, that's right. But the preacher never did anything about it. And that's something that the African Methodist Episcopal Church needs to think about. Bill Lamar, so may I ask? Do you think if the preacher had intervened and helped to form you vocationally, you might have taken a different path? Vernon Jordan, possibly. Not if my mother had anything to do with it, but possibly. But the disappointing thing was that I was a pretty talented kid. I made good grades in school. I won oratorical contests. I won the State Elk Oratorical Contest in Georgia. I won citywide essay contests. And my teachers in elementary school and at David T. Howard High School were all very encouraging. I did not get the kind of encouragement that I think I should have gotten from the ministers at St. Paul. Bill Lamar, I want to ask you about the fact that you have given much of your energy to institutions, to the United Negro College Fund, to the Urban League. And in your leadership of those institutions, tell me about what helped to make them stronger as you were a part of their work. Vernon Jordan, well, my avocation was always to be a lawyer. Austin Thomas Walden from Fort Valley, Georgia, graduated from the University of Michigan, he would come to St. Paul Aim Church once or twice a year to speak at the St. Cecilia Choir Vesper Hour on the fourth Sunday at five o'clock. And I loved hearing him talk. He would talk about segregation, and he would say about segregation, I'll be glad when you are dead, you rascal, you. And so I grew up wanting to talk like Walden, walk like Walden, dress like Walden and hang out my shingle on Auburn Avenue like Walden. He was my inspiration as a young man. I saw him his office was next door to the Butler Street colored YMCA, where I spent an awful lot of time. And J.D. Runston, who was the boy's work secretary, would get me and take me over to Colonel Walden's office, and I would fold the letters to go into the envelopes with the endorsement of the Atlanta Negro Voters League. So I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. I knew that I wanted to do something about the segregation that I was experiencing using in 1951 a textbook that had been used by a white student in 1935. The per pupil expenditure when I was in public schools in Atlanta for black students was $1, for white students, 
it was four dollars. My senior year in high school when I played the E-flat tuba, it was a bent up, beat up, hand me down E-flat tuba from the white schools. So it was a passion for me to get myself properly educated and trained to come back home to be a lawyer. I graduated Howard University Law School on a Friday, first Friday in June of 1960. On Monday morning following, I went to work for Donald L. Hollowell a great, great man for $35 a week, with a wife and a child, and I was as happy as I could be. And I am so grateful to Donald Hollowell and Austin Thomas Walden for the inspiration and for the example they set for my life. Bill Lamar, now, you have had a life of great proximity to power, to presidents, to wealth, corporate boardrooms. Having been formed in the faith and having this strong spiritual core, talk about what it has meant to you to move through those places of great power. Vernon Jordan, I tried to move through these places never forgetting from whence I came, never forgetting how I got there and who helped me to get there. Bill Lamar, and it seems like one of the ways you think about it is you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, that you have a debt of gratitude for those who paved the way for you. Vernon Jordan, I am not sure about much, Dr. Lamar. I am certain about one thing, and that is to the extent that I have had these experiences, I am confident that I did not get there by myself. There was a lot of pushing and pulling and encouragement and inspiring from the Butler Street YMCA, to Walker Street School, to Edmund A.S.A. Ware Elementary School, to David T. Howard High School. I would like to write another book. I would like to write a book about those people who made my life what it is by pushing and encouraging and inspiring me to excel and to do well. Bill Lamar, two things, Mr. Jordan, as we conclude. As you think about where you have been, what is one of the accomplishments that you have made of which you are most proud? And what is it that you are working on now that is giving you energy? Vernon Jordan, well, at 82, energy is a problem. Laughter Vernon Jordan, but I'm still an investment banker at Lazard in New York four days a week, and I continue to practice law every Friday in Washington. At 82, I have two jobs in two different cities. And I have the thought of retirement frightens me, and so I continue to look forward to going to work. I look forward to getting to Metropolitan AIM Church when I can, and to Rankin Chapel at Howard when I can my two favorite places. And if I'm ever in Atlanta, I try to get to St. Paul AIM Church, where I grew up. Bill Lamar, will you share with us the conveyance that takes you from Washington, D.C., to New York? I love to hear you talk about that transportation that you take, the way that only you can say it. Vernon Jordan, the choo-choo train, absolutely. And as soon as we finish this wonderful conversation, I'm going to go get on the choo-choo train, and in three hours I will be in the District of Columbia with you, sir. Bill Lamar, final question and I'm so appreciative of your time. The title of this podcast is Can These Bones, and I know if anyone knows the story in Ezekiel, you know it well. You mentioned what happened to you in May of 1980, you're being shot, and I know also, those who know your story, that your first wife died while you two were married. And I wanted to ask you, in the midst of having dealt with such pain and death, what gives you hope, and where have you seen resurrection? Where are you seeing resurrection? Vernon Jordan, my mother wrote to me every day from the time that I went to college until I finished law school. Some letters were long, 
some were short. Some were sad, some were glad. Whatever the basic nature of the letter, she always told me two things. One, son, if you make a dime, save two cents. Secondly, she ended every letter with the sentence, son, if you trust him, he will take care of you. That's been my guide. Bill Lamar, Mr. Jordan, it is an honor to have you on our podcast. Thank you for agreeing, and it's a joy to serve as your pastor and to share your wisdom and your hospitality. I hope that you travel safely, and I look forward to seeing you when you get back to Metropolitan. Vernon Jordan, thank you. Bill Lamar, thank you, sir. Laura Everett, that was my co-host Bill Lamar's conversation with Vernon Jordan, a civil rights leader and a longtime political figure. What a remarkable conversation with Mr. Vernon Jordan. Two things I want to start off with, I can live my whole life and still never tell stories of grace and fortitude like Vernon Jordan. That man is an unbelievable storyteller. And secondly, that is quite a congregant to be sitting in the pews as you preach. Bill Lamar, it is quite daunting, because he has heard preach all of my heroes. So it is quite daunting. But he still says nice things to me, probably so that I will not crawl into a hole and never come out again. He's been very, very encouraging. Laura Everett, let's talk about two of those preachers, Howard Thurman and Gardner Taylor, and the mentoring that Vernon Jordan experienced from them. I'm curious what did you learn from that conversation about how he was mentored and the kind of mentoring you want to do? Bill Lamar, some of the conversations that we've had for this podcast have been with folks who are outside the church, and we've gleaned knowledge to help us do our work of ministry and institutional service better. It seems to me that Vernon Jordan has mastered understanding what can be gleaned from folks who have spent their lives in the church and doing theological work, and applying that to his corporate work, his legal work and his work of community service. So Howard Thurman and for me, and it's not Howard Thurman, but Howard Washington Thurman, blessed be he just an incredible, incredible man. He was fashioned by the faith of his grandmother, who I call her the original womanist theologian, because his grandmother refused to allow him to read the writings of Paul, because of Paul's writing of slaves and being obedient. And having been enslaved, she wanted no part of any god or any person who served God who was in any way interested in slavery being perpetuated. So having experienced profound love, but also profound rejection, and coming from that, Thurman produces Jesus and the disinherited. People have said that King carried that book around with him, along with scripture. I mean, he formed Martin King, along with Benjamin Elijah Mays, to have a vision of the world that was broader than the United States, to understand God moving in ways beyond the sectarian and Christian dogma to understand the fellowship and the kindred of all human beings. So Vernon Jordan, growing up in Atlanta, would have been around all of this. I mean, he's younger, a little younger than King, and much younger than Thurman, but he sought out these wise voices. I really do believe that his spirit connected with Thurman, and he I mean, he tells of being in Thurman's home. And I just get goosebumps, I mean, the nerd juice is flowing at maximum strength. It's just an amazing thing. And then to speak of Gardner Taylor, who, to me, was just the poet laureate of the pulpit. 
I was listening to him early one Sunday morning before preaching myself and almost convinced myself that I should just stay in my apartment, or if I went to church, just press play. Laughter Laura Everett, that's right. Bill Lamar, his soaring language. And so Jordan was just drawn to these people. And I really think, listening to Mr. Jordan, Laura, and you have talked about this, we've talked about this his ability to regale with stories. I think that language, the language that he learned with the Easter speeches, the language of the church, the language he heard from Thurman it drew him. And I really believe that what makes Mr. Jordan so special is that he has spent a life crafting words, deepening relationships with persons who've spent a life with words, and he clearly understands, unlike many people living today, what a word well spoken, well chosen can do. A word well spoken, well chosen can indeed change the world. And I think that's why he was so enamored with and I would say intoxicated by Howard Thurman and Gardner Taylor. Laura Everett, I think part of what I find so beautiful about this interview is the range of people who have shaped Vernon Jordan's life. You called it a cloud of witnesses. And I'm so grateful for someone who models for me an honoring of both the bold face names and the names who might have been lost to history. Bill Lamar, I think about some of the stories that Mr. Jordan has shared. His mother called him Man M-A-N, Man. And I've thought about that a lot. I think that his mother was speaking prophetically and speaking in a way to protect him, because I think she knew that as a black man born in Atlanta in the 30s, that there would be constant assaults on his manhood but she reminded him every time she called him, wrote him, and called him man that indeed, that's what he was, a man. And in the words of the great theologian Muddy Waters, a full-grown man. And he has indeed, throughout his life, exerted himself as a man. And by that I mean someone who lives by conviction, someone who has used his own privilege to open doors and to share, someone who has not forgotten what it means, what it meant, to struggle. Laura Everett, let's talk for a minute about some of those places where doors aren't opened. One of the most remarkable things about this conversation is Mr. Jordan's flirtation with ministry with formal and ordained ministry, let me say that. More properly, we are all called to ministry by virtue of our baptism. I expect to hear emails from folks correcting me on that. That's Laura at yet. Laughter so Vernon Jordan has this consideration of ministry, and he spoke about someone saying, that Jordan boy is going to be a preacher, and the preacher said, yes, but then the preacher never did anything about it. What a poignant story about it wasn't a lack of affirmation, but it was a lack of follow-through. Right. When you heard that, what were you thinking about those pastors who noticed but did not kindle the flame that was there? Bill Lamar, Laura, I think two things. First of all, when you consider, even to my own childhood, black men in America and I just want to speak about men for a second, because of Mr. Jordan and myself if you had a strong streak of intellectual independence and that was going to drive who you were going to ministry vocationally, ministry was one of the few options that you had. And so to me, I was not at all surprised that someone as independent and vocal as Mr. Jordan had considered ministry, because it was a place where black men only, or mostly in that period could do intellectual work apart from the white gaze and white policing. I think that many a bright young man in Mr. Jordan's era considered ministry, and I think Mr. Jordan especially, because if you think about it, I mean, he was drawn to preachers, 
and not just any preachers, but the best. I do resonate with the challenge of how do you nurture someone toward ministry who has special gifts. It's very fascinating. I think about my own call. My grandmothers, both of them, said to months, that boy's going to be a preacher. My parents have shared with me that they discerned that early. But the gift, for me, is that they did not say that to me, because they knew that I was a pleaser and I probably would have gone in that direction just because they mentioned it. They allowed me to discover what God was doing myself. And I think there are two things. There's a cautionary tale about pushing people into ministry because they show certain gifts. I think it would have been very commendable if those ministers had just spent time with Mr. Jordan when he was young, asking questions about who he was, what he wanted to be. I think it's dangerous to push people in a direction of ministry, but I think it's a travesty ministry malpractice when you see people that have certain gifts, who are very young, not to engage them in conversation, leave the door open and put down breadcrumbs so if the trail of ministry is the trail for them, they'll have a clearer path. So I want to hold some things in tension, but I really, really appreciated what Mr. Jordan said. Laura Everett, that practice of encouragement I was so struck by the message that Vernon Jordan's mother said in every letter, Son, if you trust him, he will take care of you. And what a profound blessing to speak into someone's life who very intentionally put himself in places of conflict, of contention, in the service of justice and the equal dignity of black people at a time when this country was not going to give that willingly and without a very serious fight. And the example of a vocation he spoke about Austin Thomas Walden, and I confess I didn't know who Austin Thomas Walden was, and I went back and read a little bit more about his career and that he would come back to St. Paul's AIM Church to speak to the St. Cecilia Choir Vesper Hour, and how much Vernon Jordan loved hearing him talk. And that in Austin Thomas Walden, Vernon Jordan had an example of a life he could live, a person he could be, a way he could live out his sense of calling and justice in the world. I think of the women in ministry who were examples for me. I think of Diane Kessler and Deb De Winter and Lydia V. Licko, who spoke words of encouragement into my life but also showed me what a life devoted to the church could look like. Bill, I'm wondering in your life, who are the people who kept showing up, who gave you an example of vocation? Bill Lamar, those persons, Laura, are myriad. One is the pastor who helped to form me, who is now a bishop in our church and was my pastor at Bethel Aim Church in Tallahassee, Florida, Bishop Adam Jefferson Richardson, Jr. He didn't know me, but Bishop William DeVoe reads something that I had written in the Christian century, right now, a great mentor for me is my presiding elder, my immediate supervisor, Ronald Eugene Braxton, who is a breath of fresh air and someone who will tell you the truth, lovingly. I don't make many moves without consulting him. Presiding Elder James Melvin Proctor, a man of wisdom and great stature, who encouraged me to get in the work of agitation and organizing. And not just them, but very faithful laypersons who made sure that I had money for seminary, Miss Maddie Green, God bless her soul. And for me, the highest place of privilege is reserved for my own biological family, my mother, my father, my grandparents, uncles, cousins, aunts, who surrounded me with love and who showed me what discipleship looked like. And most of all, I'm sending cards and crisp $100 bills to all of those people, 
because they were patient with me as a young man who had a question every time I inhaled, with every time I exhaled, a question attended it. I drove many people crazy. Laura Everett, you were that kid in Sunday school, huh? Bill Lamar, yes, I was that kid. One of the things that I want to mention again, I'm not boasting, but I tell you, there's nothing like being formed in southern black churches, because people are well aware of the goodness of God, but also well aware of the hell outside the doors. And one of the things that they did brilliantly, the ancestors did brilliantly, was prepare us with Easter speeches. Daniel Black, the great author I spoke with in episode 7, and Vernon Jordan, unprompted, both mentioned Easter speeches. As kids, we were given speeches to memorize on Easter Sunday, to stand in our Sunday best and proclaim that Christ has risen. Some really bad poetry, some really good scripture we were called to memorize a lot of stuff. And what's interesting is the child who was the smartest and who had the best elocution and diction was not the one who got the most applause. But the child who stumbled through and worked hard would get a standing ovation, because the church was encouraging that young lady, that young man to continue to do the hard work that would give birth to excellence in their lives, to generational excellence. And so what is clear about Vernon Jordan, what is clear about so many people, is were it not for the brilliance of the people who made those institutions work in the midst of unspeakable hostility, he would not be where he is. Laura Everett, it's so clear that that internal fortitude, that sense of one's own dignity and blessedness as a beloved child of God, when everything in the world is telling you otherwise, that that is part of the strength that leads Vernon Jordan into a life of, really, devotion to some pretty major have been institutions. I think about that vision of black churches forming youth to be in public leadership. And how Vernon Jordan was the only black student in a class of 400 at DePau, and what it must have been like at that moment. And how the formation he had received as a young person in the church kept speaking a word of dignity and blessing and affirmation into his life. My God, the amount of courage and strength to be the only black student in a class of 400, so far from home. It says two things to me. 1. It says Vernon Jordan has led an unbelievable life, and there's much to learn here. But it also gives me real hope for what the church can be and how we can form people to claim and live into their dignity and their giftedness as children of God even when the rest of the not see that gift. Bill Lamar, what was intriguing and also blessed was that Vernon Jordan is not so much talking about the past as he is moving into his future, as a man over 80. He shows that one does not have to stop, that one does not have to retire from their passion, but you can continue to move. And it seems to me that, in the words of my late grandfather, Mr. Jordan will not rust out, but he will wear out. He's going to keep doing what it is that he needs to do. That was so refreshing. Laura Everett, I think that's also a word of affirmation and blessing to our listeners. Thanks for this conversation. Bill Lamar, thank you for listening to Can These Bones. There's more about Mr. Vernon Jordan, including archival audio interviews from 1964, at www.candthezebens.com Who are we talking to next time? Laura Everett, I had a great conversation with Matt Croesman, who teaches a wildly popular course called Life Worth Living at Yale College. Episode 12 Matthew Croesman on how, and why, to ask, what makes a life worth living.
In the final episode of Can These Bones, co-host Laura Everett talks with Matthew Croesman about the popular Yale undergraduate course that invites students to apply the best of their intellectual energy to questions of meaning, purpose, value, and worth. What constitutes a life worth living? And how do you begin to explore that question? The Rev. Dr. Matthew Croesman and his colleagues tackle the issue in a course offered by the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. In it, students engage with a range of philosophical and religious traditions to form habits of reflection that will equip them for the lifelong process of discerning the good life. In his conversation with Can These Bones co-host Laura Everett, Croesman talks about what he has learned from teaching the course, why engaging with other religious traditions is vital to his faith, and why he is one of the faculty advisors for Yale's secular humanist community. Laura Everett, from Faith and Leadership, this is Can These Bones, a podcast that asks a fresh set of questions about leadership and the future of the church. I'm Laura Everett. Bill Lamar, and I'm Bill Lamar. This is the last episode in our series of conversations with leaders from the church and from other fields. Through this podcast, we have aimed to share our hope in the resurrection and perhaps breathe life into leaders struggling in valleys of dry bones. Laura, you spoke with Matt Croesman, a pastor and research scholar who teaches a wildly popular undergraduate class at Yale. Tell us a little more about Matt. Laura Everett, Matt is the director of the Life Worth Living program at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And Matt and his wife, Hannah, also planted and have pastored the Elm City Vineyard Church in New Haven. By training, he's a Paul scholar. He's an author and an interfaith advocate. But the focus of this interview is really Matt's work in teaching the Life Worth Living course at Yale College. The course was founded by the theologian Myris Labolf and Ryan McAnally Linz. The course has been offered since 2014, and it's proved to be wildly popular so much so that it's now being offered at other universities. I want to read you the course description, because I think it helps give a sense of what's going on here. It's the course Humanities 411, and it reads thus, Life Worth Living draws upon a range of philosophical and religious traditions to help students develop habits of reflection that will equip them for the lifelong process of discerning the good life. What does it mean for a life to go well? In short, what shape would a life worth living take? We will explore these questions through engagement with the lives and visions of founding figures from six diverse religious traditions of imagining a good life, the Buddha, the Torah, and the Hebrew prophetic and wisdom writers, Jesus of Nazareth, Muhammad, John Stuart Mill, and Friedrich Nietzsche. The course itself is fascinating, and perhaps what's even more fascinating is the overwhelmingly positive response to it. Students are excited to take this, and curious to ask this big question, what constitutes a life worth living? Bill Lamar, you've almost made me want to go back to undergraduate, but probably not. Laura Everett, no, I'm good. Bill Lamar, Let's hear your conversation. Laura Everett, Matt Croesman, welcome to Can These Bones. Matt Croesman, thanks so much. Great to be here. Laura Everett, we're really glad to have you today. So this course, this Yale College undergrad course, Life Worth Living, began in the spring of 2014. Tell us the origin story of life worth living. Matt Croesman, sure. Actually, 
that particular story is only tangentially connected to me personally. But my colleagues Myris Lobvolf and Ryan McAnally Linz began designing this course when Ryan and I were both still in graduate school. Myris Lobv is a professor of theology at the Divinity School, and Ryan was one of his graduate students. And I think it began in large part for Myris Lobv with a kind of diagnosis of something unsettling in our universities and in our culture at large. I think a particular book that crystallized many things for him was Anthony Cronman's book Education's End, Why Our Colleges and Universities Have Given Up on the Meaning of Life. And that book makes basically that case, that fundamental question of, what is the good life? What is the sort of life worth having? What's the sort of life worth wanting? What's the sort of life that we ought to want for ourselves and ought to want for our children? That fundamental question is both deeply contested these days, in ways that perhaps it was not in more homogeneous cultural environments, and yet at the same time, that question has been sort of given up on. It's no longer a question that's being asked and answered in today's universities. So indeed, for at least a year if not more in advance of teaching the course, Ryan and Myroslav and my other colleagues at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture were gathering scholars and professors from all over the country and asking, is it possible to ask and answer this question in a pluralistic environment and still take issues of truth really, really seriously? And the course that they taught for the first time in 2014 and that we've refined and expanded since then is our answer to that question. Laura Everett, so clearly, students at Yale are smart and ambitious. I'm curious about what were the signs that you and your colleagues saw the notice that there was something missing? Matt Croesman, well, there are a number of signs. Some of them you can see earlier, some of them take longer. To be frank, on this campus, the Title IX reports that have come out in the last several years about sexual violence on this campus would be among the sort of signs that, early on that is, while students are here at Yale there is a sign that what it means to do right by one another, what it means to form this sort of come of honor and respect, is something that's not happening the way that anyone here would want it to be. I think a lot of the signs, though, may take longer to appear. But Bill DeRicio is, in a book which I'm not sure is entirely fair to the Yale education, but some of his criticism is really well received in a book called Excellent Cheap, talks about that what many elite students are really good at is running on well-defined tracks. They're not very good, necessarily, at charting their own way in the world. The last moment and of course, we could talk about many other signs but the last moment to talk about is the midlife crisis for those who do succeed. They run on those career paths. They get everything they thought they wanted. And all of a sudden at the end, they realize they're deeply dissatisfied. And often they get to 50, 55, and they are winning wasn't worth it. Because maybe they won a race that wasn't worth winning. And so these questions of value and of worth, I think, were highlighted again and again, from the undergraduate careers of our students all the way into later periods of life, in which it was clear that these questions of worth, of meaning and value, were questions that our students are not prepared to answer. They're worse for it, and the world in which they are in many cases leaders is worse for it as well. Laura Everett, Matt, you talked about the tendency for people with wisdom and talent to know how to move on well-defined tracks, and maybe even strive to move fast on well-defined tracks, but that the winning might not be worth it. 
It strikes me in the same way that academic courses can also run on well-defined tracks the intro to engineering, the Psych 101. There is a path that is clearly laid out for academic programming, and it strikes me that you all made the same decision, to create a course that was not just about being on a well-defined track. I imagine were there places of resistance for this kind of course? Matt Croesman, I remember when the course was first taught, there were these questions. We offer a retreat for students to attend, and at first we weren't sure, is this allowed? Is this appropriate? What would some of our colleagues think? What would administrators think? We had some sense of what the bright lines were in terms of what we you know, we couldn't require students to come to the retreat, but we could certainly offer it. But something like that really starts to sit outside, wait, wait, what are you doing with your students there? Well, we're taking them away for a weekend, and we're inviting them to tell each other their stories and to share really personally where they're coming from, where they're headed. And so I think that, too, was something that sat really clearly outside the norm. The other practice that I'd point out would be, on the very first day of class, I tell students usually within the first 10 minutes of the first day of class I tell students, look, I am a Christian, and worse yet, I'm a Christian pastor. I tell them, look, I feel like I need to tell you this because it means I can't be your neutral tour guide about questions of the good life. We, in our course and presumably we'll talk more about this we look at all kinds of different answers to the question of the good life. Religious answers, non-religious, philosophical answers, answers and traditions that sort of sit in between categories of religion and philosophy and help us even think about what those categories are and what they mean. But I can't pretend to be neutral as we walk through. Because of my Christian convictions, it's really important to me that the classroom be an open environment in which anyone, wherever they're coming from, can approach each of these traditions and really hear them honestly and charitably, and give each tradition its fair hearing. But again, I don't do that despite my Christian convictions. I do that because of my Christian convictions. Because of who I know Jesus to be, I understand part of my love of neighbor to extend to that intellectual generosity that I want to offer to my students and to the authors and the traditions that we engage in the class. But I tell them right from the beginning, look, this is who I am. This is where I'm situated. I know that you're situated somewhere, too. And I hope that right from the beginning, we'll recognize as we have these conversations that none of us is located nowhere. All of us come from somewhere. We have convictions. We have instincts. We have a history and a background and a set of impulses that have brought us to this table that are going to shape our conversation together and I hope even might themselves that is, our deep convictions might themselves be shaped by our conversation together. But that's only going to happen if we actually bring our whole selves to the table. You know, I have multiple students every year tell me that they recognize, oh, that is not normal. That is not the professorial neutrality which is only ever a myth. But even at least the myth of that neutrality is their standard experience, and they really, really appreciate that forthrightness. Anyway, we could keep going on. There are many things that we do that are non-standard, at least in our sort of environment. But the reason we do go ahead and teach a course and make it try to fit in this sort of box is that we want students Yale students are smart. I mean, 
our young people are brilliant wherever we're encountering them, at whatever institution we're encountering them. And what we want to say by putting this in the curriculum because we could have taught this outside the curriculum. We could have put together another extracurricular. And of course, there are extracurricular communities that are helping students ask these questions, many of them campus ministries. In their best moments, that's what's happening there. But we wanted to put it in the curriculum in order to say, you know, the best of your intellect, the very best of your thinking that you apply to organic chemistry or to Russian literature, the very finest, the best of your intellectual energy that's actually what this question of meaning and purpose and value and worth is worth. This deserves the very best of your intellectual energies. And so by putting it in the classroom now, of course, that means we have to reshape the classroom in all the ways that I just said but by putting it in the classroom, we're trying to say, this deserves the very best of your intellectual energies. You can reason about this. You're never going to become an expert in answering this question, but you can get better at asking it. Posing it rightly. Thinking about it charitably, learning how to think about it together with people very much unlike you. And those sorts of things may not sound like the normal sorts of intellectual challenges that you're going to be presented with in the classroom. But they are no less intellectual, no less intellectually rigorous, and no less worth the best of your intellectual and academic energies. Laura Everett, I want to turn for just a second to ask about you, because you said that all of us are located somewhere. And you and your wife, Hannah, were intentional about locating yourself, planting yourself, quite literally as pastors, with Elm City Vineyard Church in New Haven. I wonder, how has teaching this course, Life Worth Living, changed your pastoring? Matt Croesman, you know, I think it's shaped it a lot. And people who are in my church would tell you they hear a lot about this course in sermon illustrations and just in life together. I said one of the ways that we do tackle these questions, even on a college campus these days, is we I hope we tackle them in campus ministries. And that was my experience as an undergraduate. I was part of an intervarsity Christian fellowship, it was life for me. I believe in the church. I love Christ-centered communities. I planted one. I'm all about that. But if that's the only context in which we ever ask and answer these questions, I think we're really, really missing something. And so I think this course has informed my pastoring, largely in saying, hey, the conversation we're having here in the church? This is really, really valuable. And it's not a but, right? And, because we follow Jesus Jesus who engaged with people across religious boundaries, across cultural boundaries, across all kinds of different socio-economic sorts of boundaries because we follow that Jesus, we should expect that Jesus is in fact still going to speak to us across those sorts of boundaries today. So in our church, we've intentionally cultivated relationship with the mosques and the Muslim communities in our city and in our metro area here. And we've done that in a way that hasn't been this isn't about proselytizing, but it might be about a richer vision of evangelism. And with some of our interlocutors, who, in their Muslim convictions, have hopes for evangelization as well I've learned more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus by my engagement with my Muslim neighbors than I ever could just within the walls of the church. And so our church itself has become we've led people into those sorts of experiences. I'll never forget. One Saturday afternoon in the early fall in New Haven, 
we were working together with a local mosque, Masjid al-Islam, and they were giving out they're located in a poorer neighborhood here in our city and they were giving away book bags with school supplies for students as they were starting school. And we just thought, okay, well, that's fantastic. We would love to help with that. How can we do that? And so we show up early that morning, we show up at the mosque, and we ask, what can we do? And they say, you know, what we could really use you for is if you could go door to door in the neighborhoods around here and invite people to come down to the mosque. And I remember you know, the vineyards an evangelical sort of movement. So you can imagine how challenging that might be for folks in a mainline church, and an evangelical church may be even more challenging, right? Okay, we're going to go door to door inviting people to the mosque. And my father was with me, and as we're going door to door, I remember my father was maybe the one, I don't know, knocking on this particular door. And he gave them the flyer. He said, hey, they're handing out book bags and school supplies, you should come down to the mosque. It's just down the street. And the person said, oh sure, thanks. And as we were walking away, they sort of quickly profiled us and asked, wait, are you Muslim? And my father, God bless him, I'll never forget, just turned around and with all innocence and sincerity, said, oh, no, but we're followers of Jesus. And we just think that if Jesus was here, the thing that Jesus would be doing is helping hand out book bags of school supplies down at the mosque. So we hope to see you there. And I just love that, right? Because the answer wasn't, oh yeah, no, we're not Muslims, but we're Christians, and it's more or less the same, and I hope we'll see you down there. Right? It was, no, we're not. There's a real difference here. We're followers of Jesus, and because of not despite our difference, our particularity but because of our particularity, because of the particularity of who Jesus is, for that reason, we're going door to door inviting people to the mosque. And I could repeat that story with the second sort of humanist community in our town and other sorts of communities in which we've been engaged. And so for me, that's become sort of irreducible. That's completely changed my picture of evangelism, in ways that maybe I've described a bit already. But it's also just changed my sense of discipleship that that's how I come to know who Jesus is. And how I grow as a follower of Jesus is by encountering Jesus in these perhaps surprising ways among these other communities. And I learn so much about Jesus in those encounters. Laura Everett, you know, Matt, I had a question prepared about how this course is changing your students, I didn't have a question prepared about how this course is changing you. Right? It sounds like this is really changing a number about how you see yourself as a pastor, what your church's relationship is to your neighbors, what it means to be clearly rooted in a tradition but widely open. That teaching in a pluralistic setting is changing something about how you think church can be in relationship with the world. Am I onto something there? Matt Croesman, absolutely. So I remember just wrestling so much, am I a pastor? Am I a scholar? Am I called to the church? Am I called to the academy? And it all came together around, oh, I'm a teacher. When I lead my church best, it's when I'm teaching. That's the mode in which I pastor best. Actually, in my personal life, with my daughter, 
when I father best is often when I'm teaching her something. And I came to figure out, oh, I'm a teacher. But what this course has taught me is more about what being a teacher, what teaching is. And I think that part of what this'll be a little bit meta but I think that part of what real teaching is, is learning. I can't ask my students to put their lives on the table and be ready to be potentially transformed by their encounter with one or another of the traditions that we're going to encounter together without putting my life on the table in a similar sort of way. And so absolutely, my life has been changed, in part, just by the encounter with these traditions. I've sort of fallen in love with Confucius, which I never would have thought. The Analects are just so powerful. And I feel like I've come to understand I'm a Paul scholar by training I've come to understand Paul's sense of the self and the social better by thinking about that question together with Confucius. But it really is more than just the specifics of encountering each of these traditions though, of course, my Sabbath practice has been enriched by engaging with Judaism, and you keep getting those sorts of specific examples. But even more, it's been this sort of meta-practice that what it means to encounter Jesus is to go encounter Jesus among the people that my old evangelical self might have imagined needed to have Jesus preached to them. I am at the moment one of the faculty advisors for the secular humanist community here at Yale, the Yale humanist community. Laura Everett, hold up. There is a vineyard pastor who is the faculty advisor for the Yale secularist community. Matt Croesman, one of. But yes. Laura Everett, okay. Matt Croesman, yeah and my bio on their website begins with Matt Croesman is the director of the Life Worth Living program and staff pastor at the Elm City Vineyard Church. Now, some of that's because of the incredible charity and wisdom and openness of Chris Stedman, who for many years was the leader of that community. But the reason I've gotten so engaged in that community has been, again, not in spite of my commitment to Jesus but because of my commitment to Jesus. I stumbled into this community at a time when a man who has now become a friend of mine, Tom Cratton Maker, was writing a book called Confessions of a Secular Jesus Follower. He's a board member for the humanist community. He would tell you he's pretty sure Jesus isn't the Son of God, inasmuch as there is no God, but he just can't let go of the words of Jesus. He'd ask me as a Christian, he'd say, I know you guys, like, sit with this book all the time. But have you read it? Have you seen what's in here? I mean, this guy, he says to love my enemies. I don't even love my friends that well. Like, what I been to church. You guys don't seem to be all that flustered by this. But when I sit down and read this maybe it's the religion that's gotten you sort of, like, to the point where this doesn't strike you like it strikes me. Maybe I'm putting words in his mouth. I think that's probably what's happened. But I'm hearing, all of a sudden, afresh, the true power of Jesus' vision of a way of life from my friend Tom the Atheist. And he started a monthly gathering so all of a sudden, despite my best efforts to say, no, no, I want to be here and hear from you all on your terms, I want to hear what it's like. So many of my students are secular, they don't have commitments to a particular religion or philosophy. Maybe they're committed to something like humanism, I'd love to find out how you're thinking about life. Please, don't change what you're talking about because I'm here despite all of my insistence, I found myself in a monthly meeting with a group of 8 to 10 atheists, and every week, 
all we were talking about was Jesus. I kept saying, guys, please, can we talk about something else? But all, you know, Tom was trying to let's talk about Jesus. He said, I think Jesus is the great humanizer. This is who Jesus is for me. The teachings of Jesus help me become more fully human, and as a secular humanist, I can't think of anyone better for us to spend our time talking about. Now of course, Tom's a bit controversial within the secular humanist community for that. But I thought, Jesus came to make us more fully human. I thought, that is brilliant Christological insight. This may have been what Irenaus was trying to tell us. I mean, I can go back deep in the church's history study. Anyway, so it's those sorts of encounters that have me thinking. I mean, I love my small group, I love Bible study in the church, I love praying for one another and worshipping together, and again, I'm the biggest fan of the church you'll ever meet. But there is something irreducible to my spiritual life now. I have to be able to sit down with people who don't believe like me, who, if we ever do stumble upon my scriptures, our scriptures, they're going to read them with fresh eyes. If we ever do talk about Jesus, they're going to have that sort of perspective. And more than even all the particularities of encountering the details of my tradition, I know that we have this shared question, where we're all trying to figure out, what does it mean to live a good life? What does it mean to live the true life? What is the life that's most worth wanting? Charles Taylor, the philosopher, says it doesn't matter whether you are a religious person or not, we all live in this secular age. And what it means to live in a secular age is not that religious belief is impossible but that religious belief is no longer assumed. And so that's why I've found something so shared with my secular humanist friends, because I may find my way into a life following Jesus. That's where I'm located. But I have to choose that again every morning, or I have to construct I have to choose to live my life that way. This question of flourishing life, of the good life, is still pressing to me in a way that, well, I want to be more and more analogous in many ways to my secular humanist friends. And spending time with them and feeling the urgency of that question, for those who are trying to construct meaning, whether it's bricolage out of various different pieces that are out there or something more existential from their inner convictions, or however they're trying to do that. The urgency of that quest sharpens the urgency of my own discipleship to Jesus. And yeah, I have been changed. I have been spoiled for any other sort of religious life. Laura Everett, Matt, what a beautiful vision of what is possible as a Christian pastor, as a scholar, and most importantly, as a teacher. It is impossible to listen to you and not hear that there is life being breathed in and through coursework, academic institutions, Christian institutions, by this wild and brave openness. The Life Worth Living course is now going to be offered at other universities. We're so curious to see how scaling and sharing what you've learned spreads to other communities. Matt Croesman, thank you so much for joining me on Can These Bones. It's been a real joy to speak with you. Matt Croesman, likewise. Thanks so much. This has been a great conversation. Bill Lamar, that was my co-host Laura Everett's conversation with Matt Croesman, a pastor and a teacher at Yale. This conversation was indeed quite interesting. And let's talk about a life worth living. I mean, 
it seems like a simple concept not simplistic, but simple yet quite elegant and quite thick, as Matt describes it. As you do your work with the Massachusetts Council of Churches, what would you describe to your constituents as a life worth living? Laura Everett, I hope my life is a life worth living if the world is more just when I leave it. I hope my life is a life worth living if there is more truth and beauty in the world, if people are kinder and gentler and more honest to one another because I've been in it. I think my life has been worth living if I've shown something of the overwhelming and liberating love of God. And if that's what I've done, then I can go home. Bill Lamar, don't go today, Laura. We've got more work for you to do. Laura Everett, yeah, I've got a board meeting coming up. Laughter but also, I think there's a parallel question, actually, for churches, what is the life of a congregation worth living? What is a church that has reason to exist in a community? Christians have this practice of asking these questions and offering some answers. We say pretty clearly that a life worth living is not just one about making money or public acclaim, but in service to God and to our neighbors. But I also wondered I mean, this conversation with Matt really got me asking, are churches asking these questions? Do you think churches are asking these questions about what constitutes a life worth living? Bill Lamar, Laura, I don't want to throw water on the flame, but in my experience, I think that instead of the inquiry, what we are doing is repeating what we have heard. I don't think that we are wrestling with that question, what is the life worth living? What is the cross-shaped life, the gospel-shaped life? What does that mean? I don't experience that enough. And to be honest, it may just be the air that we breathe. I have to force myself sometimes to start from that place, because it's so much easier to read what someone else has written and to repeat it or to go with the tropes and the stuff that we've heard all of our lives. But to step back and to ask the question. And I think that for the class to be so popular at a place like Yale you know, I think about the book God and Man at Yale, by the late conservative writer William F. Buckley, just talking about what kind of campus that was and is. I mean, these are the future leaders of the world in many ways. And so their hunger, I think, points to a deeply human hunger. If congregations and Christian institutions can facilitate these kinds of conversations around what makes a life worth living, or a community worth living into, I really think that we would be doing a great service. It seems to me that as Jesus is walking with the disciples, a lot of what is happening could be considered a course in life worth living, how do I live a life worth living when I see my neighbor in pain? When I see my neighbor sick? When I see people being oppressed? How do I then engage in worthy living? It's very interesting. Laura Everett, I think of really, one church comes to mind when I think about whether or not this is happening broadly. And I want to stipulate, there are probably places that this conversation is happening that I haven't seen. It turns out, I actually don't know all of the churches. As it turns out, Laffer do you remember when our friend Stephen Chapin Garner was pastoring at the UCC church in Norwell? Bill Lamar, yes, very much so, I visited with them. Laura Everett, they had a small group around vocational discernment. It was specific, it was designed for when people were at a place, at an inflection point in their vocation, in their careers, and they were thinking about making a change. 
and they gathered a group of people around them to pray and discern and listen for the will of God about what the next move might be. I think about a number of my Quaker congregations that I work with regularly that have clearness committees that do that work of discernment in community. But for the most part, I don't always see churches asking these big questions. I wonder if we're afraid of the heft of the language. It's a big question to ask, is your life worth living? There's almost something accusatory in that. Bill Lamar, the dean at Duke Divinity School, Elaine Heath, has a small book that she shared. And one of the questions in the book is essentially, what I am getting from it, the question is, maybe our God is too small. That God is so much larger than we can imagine. She's using, as a partner, Paul's writing to the Galatian church. But I think about this. I think the reason we're not asking this question in some corners of the Christian community is it might disrupt notions of God. It could indeed be, as I've heard someone say, that we worship a notion of God, and not God. That asking these questions might force us to see a God at work in the world and in our institutions that might cause us to have to do things totally different, and make us very uncomfortable. I think the truth of the matter is all of us acculturate to a deity who kind of lets us get away with doing what we're doing and being who we are. And asking this question is going to throw you into new categories. And what I appreciate about what Matt talks about is, when he's talking to his class you know, he's got people who are religious, people who are not religious, there are religious answers to the question, there are non-religious, there are philosophical answers but the one thing that he seems to value is that you start authentically. I think this is where the modern church at Metropolitan, I've had people to come into the church to say that they're both Buddhist and Christian, to say they don't know if they're Muslims or Christians and what the church has to do today is what Matt is doing in that classroom. Whoever you are, wherever you start, let's engage the conversation. Not, go back and think like me, and come back and ask the question again. And I think that, especially for insular faiths that have not been used to new people coming in with new ideas, I think quite frankly if we look at theology and politics in America, people are often scared as hell of new ideas. Questions dislodge us. I think we've got a lot of work to do, and I think Matt is pointing the way. Laura Everett, one thing that comes through so clearly in this is that they're asking these big questions, not in isolation, but in community. This isn't a self-directed study. They're working this out with one another. And there's a theological fearlessness that I think Matt embodies for me, in saying, like, yes, I'm a Christian, and I need to be in conversation with Confucius writings and practicing Muslims. Right. That he can live unthreatened by the possibility that God might show him something from another tradition, but that it must be done in community. I don't disregard that personal reflection time in meditation and contemplation is really important for listening to the voice of God. But part of the design of this course is that you can only kind of get at these big questions when you do it collaboratively. Bill Lamar, I really, really want, myself, to begin to keep and I think it's a practice that I've engaged but keep practicing listening to many. I think that many of us, our reading of scripture and tradition makes us think that there may even be something sacrilegious to engage with the thinking of others. But there is just, there is no way around it, and we should not look for ways around thinking through the wisdom of the ages and how that can help us to live more clearly into what I think is God's vision for the world. Again, 
you know, Matt names himself as a Christian pastor. He is clear about that, but he's able to facilitate this discussion. And I think that if we have a faith that will not engage with others based on the truths that they hold, I would have to question what it is that we have. Laura Everett, it reminds me, actually, of what we heard Eric Barreto say in an earlier episode, that if our theology cannot answer to the experience of Ferguson, then our theology is too small. In a related way, I think Matt's saying if our beliefs cannot engage with the world beyond our beliefs and our system for meaning making, then our faith is too small. I don't want a brittle Christianity. I want this vibrant, robust, integrated thinking that I really think we're seeing in how Matt is thinking as a pastor, as a teacher, as a scholar and researcher as someone who gets to be the facilitator of such a glorious set of questions. I need that integrated thinking. Bill Lamar, and I think also, Laura, we want to commend the many congregations and Christian institutions who are trying to facilitate these inquisitive spaces, where they can engage questions like, is life worth living, or, how can we live lives worth living together? We want to commend them. And for those who are trying to figure out how to do it, one of the practical things that we've engaged at Metropolitan is to convene on Wednesday nights and instead of studying books of scripture all the time, we've read books together and asked questions together. And it has grown, and people are coming, because people want to engage in church, where they don't have to hide their theological commitments, but they want to use that as a basis to have conversations with other people who are talking about things differently. And I really believe that finding books to study, bringing in people to have conversations who may be different we've had immigrants come in, we've had people from other faiths to come in. How can we help to facilitate that kind of communal reality? I think that the church has a great opportunity here. Laura Everett, what I hear is that at Metropolitan, it's not just an accidental conversation, it's an intentional one. That you are intentionally putting yourself in conversation with issues and questions that your congregants are asking, not just on Sunday morning, but through the rest of their lives. Bill Lamar, I have to say this that these conversations can be very uncomfortable. Our leaders had a conversation last night, and it's uncomfortable. We left with a feeling of love, but there was also tension. So I think that the church must learn that love and tension can coexist not love and violence, but love and tension, which might give birth to something beautiful. Those things can coexist. Laura Everett, one of the things about being in conversation with other communities, other ideas, other religious traditions that I noticed in that interview with Matt is something that shifts around language. Matt is unabashedly Christian. He has a sense of where his most serious commitments come from but he's also learning to talk in a way that doesn't immediately shut down conversation with people who aren't connected to the church. And part of what I've learned by being in regular contact with people who don't use the church vernacular is that I have to speak more broadly and clearly in ways that invite other people in. That there's a real gift in getting outside of my own community, because I can't just, like, go to the usual shorthand, or the terms that are such insider baseball. And I think that's part of what's happening as Matt's teaching, too. Bill Lamar, there is a spaciousness and a largeness, too. And I think it's very appropriate that Matt is our concluding conversation, because he offers for us, for our churches, for our institutions, enthusiasm, hope, the integration of the church and the academy, 
the world of the church and the world of those who are not churched, not in churches, and a dedication to the succeeding generations. So I think it's very interesting he's holding in tension the past received traditions, both the gospel tradition and other religious and theological and wisdom traditions holding the ancient in tension with the strivings and the hunger of the young. And I think that, wow, it shows quite a pattern for the church and for Christian institutions. This kind of integrative thinking offers so much hope and possibility. Laura Everett, well, and listeners, we really hope that this kind of integrated thinking is what we've offered through the series of 12 podcasts. I know that I have learned a ton about communicating and asking good and generous questions. I've never done interviews like this before, so I feel like thank you. I want to say a word of gratitude to all of you listening who learned alongside Bill and me as we learned how to ask good questions. Bill, I'm wondering what else you feel like you've learned through this process. Bill Lamar, I have learned to be joyful about the fact that there are people around the world asking wonderful questions, doing great things, and that I don't have to do it all but I do need to be in some kind of communication or conversation with these folks. And I think this is why podcasts are booming. Because in some way, we are afforded the privilege of listening to conversations we might not have the privilege to listen to were it not for the miracle of this modern technology. And so I don't have to work at JetBlue to learn from Marty. I don't have to be in Austin to learn from Gideon. I don't have to ride the train from Washington to New York to learn from Vernon Jordan. I can indeed just sit back in places of comfort and hear the conversations. And I am now even more committed, Laura, to listening into, if you will, some holy ear hustling, some holy eavesdropping into the kinds of conversations that will remind me that God is at work in so many places. As the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins says, Christ plays in 10,000 places everywhere these things are happening. And it's happening in the church, outside of the church, in boardrooms, in coffee shops, in classrooms. And it excites me, and I want to continue to listen, because I think it makes me a better pastor, a better friend, a better leader, a better servant of the gospel that I am compelled called, and joyful to preach. Laura Everett, listeners, you've heard the benediction from the R.T. Rev. William H. Lamar IV. Now go and do likewise. Bill Lamar, something like that. Hey, Laura, I think that we want to continue the conversation. How do you feel about inviting the good folks to join us on social media with their questions about how bones are living in their realities? There are so many more stories out there. Bill Lamar, and, listeners, if you found the conversations valuable, please do share them with your friends, with your colleagues. And if you're a good Christian, you should also share them with your enemies. And we'd like also to direct you to our website at www.candthezebans.com, that you might continue to share the good work of our conversation partners. And indeed, we want to invite you to be asking in your churches, to be asking in your institutions, in your friendship groups, can these bones live? To look at places of brokenness and death and to have the audacity, to have the gall, maybe to have the faith, to say, I still see life. Laura Everett, thank you for listening to Can These Bones. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we did. There's more about Matt Croesman, including information about the Life Worth Living course, 
at www.candazebens.com you'll also find the audio and other information from all 12 episodes of this podcast. Thank you very much for watching this video. Remember to click and subscribe to see the latest news. See you in the star videos.